My sixth sense is telling me that there's a new M. Night Shyamalan movie in theaters, and I have my thoughts right now. This review is brought to you by Athletic Greens. Go to athleticgreens.com slash Dan for a special offer and stay tuned after the review for more info. Hello, everybody, and welcome to my review of the newest M. Night Shyamalan film, Knock at the Cabin. And, you know, I'll say this about M. Night Shyamalan. I actually look forward to his movies coming out because whether I love them or whether I hate them, it is very rare. I don't think it's ever happened that I've walked out of an M. Night Shyamalan movie with kind of a, eh, no opinion. He is a very bold filmmaker, and sometimes he makes all the wrong choices, but he makes those choices confidently. And luckily for me, and I think for a lot of other people, Knock at the Cabin is one of those movies that I came out of talking about in a good way and not a bad way. Knock at the Cabin is based on Paul Tremblay's 2018 novel, The Cabin at the End of the World. So even though it does share some similarities to another horror film about a cabin in the woods, it's not from the script of this movie. It's actually mostly drawn from the source material. The screenplay is from first-time feature screenwriters Steve Desmond and Michael Sherman, who then had their script rewritten and revised by M. Night Shyamalan, who of course also directs. This is also only the second R-rated film from M. Night Shyamalan after The Happening, and it's kind of a curious rating because I didn't really see anything in the film that said to me that it needed to be rated R, unlike some things in The Happening. But the comparisons between Knock at the Cabin and The Happening don't stop there. I actually think that there are some similarities to the happening or between these two films, but in a good way. Fleabag's Ben Aldridge and Hamilton's Jonathan Groff star as Andrew and Eric, two dads who take a family trip to a secluded cabin with their young daughter Wen, played by Kristen Cooey in her acting debut. When a man named Leonard, played by Dave Bautista, emerges from the woods, others soon follow and they invade the cabin, gravely informing the family that a sacrifice is required in order to avoid a worldwide calamity. The other home invaders are played by Abby Quinn, the outfits Nikki Amuka Bird and Rupert Grant affecting a very disgruntled Northeastern accent. But the revelation in this movie for me, and I think for a lot of people walking out, is Dave Bautista. He's been in a lot of movies, and I've enjoyed him in so many movies. Of course, Guardians of the Galaxy, playing Drax, Blade Runner 2049, he had a very effective early scene there. And then he's popped up in a lot of other films that I think that he was really good in. But this was, for me, easily his best performance on film thus far. You have to understand that we cannot and will not choose who is to be sacrificed for you. And just as importantly, we cannot act for you. He takes on the weight of the entire movie. He's required for exposition and also to convey the gravity of what's going on. And it's a pretty closely confined movie. And I think that he nails it. His growth as an actor has been really, really fun to watch. And I think that not only is this unquestionably his best performance, I think it's one of the best performances in an M. Night Shyamalan film. And some people might scoff and say like, well, that's not a whole lot of competition. But when you think about it, when you think about some of the really good films that M. Night Shyamalan's made, or even some of the so-so films with good performances, I think that's pretty high praise. Dave Bautista is really, really good in this movie. The less that you know about Knock at the Cabin, the better, because the first trailer, which was the only one that I saw, I think actually set it up pretty effectively. It shows you basically stuff from the first 10 minutes of the movie, which is the essential premise that you have a family, they're at a cabin, there are home invaders, and they're told that if a sacrifice of some type doesn't happen, then there will be a huge worldwide event of some sort. I didn't realize that a second trailer had come out. Mara actually brought it to my attention. Uh, she had seen it in front of a different movie that she'd gone to see that I didn't go to her with. And it actually gives away or takes away some of the mystery of a lot of what happens. And that sucks because so much of the tension of this movie is centered around this question of, is this calamity that's forecast actually something that's going to happen? Or is it something that's completely in the minds of these four people that are in this family's living room? Are they complete lunatics, just murderous strangers? There's so much suspense around that question. We're not choosing anyone. We're not sacrificing anyone. Not now, not ever. Even if it means the death of everyone else in the world. Yes. Even if I believe the world was at stake, which I don't, that's what it means. And these other trailers that came out really give away far too much as far as the direction that the movie takes. 
it's not so much that there's one of those M. Night Shyamalan twists in the movie that you don't really have that. It's just that there is so much tension around this question. And as always, the studio decided to sacrifice apparently so much of that tension in the name of trying to sell the film through different visuals, etc. I was so glad I didn't see those trailers. And, you know, just I would ask you to trust me on this movie. Take a flyer on it and don't watch any of those other promotional materials if you haven't seen them because I enjoyed the movie so much more not knowing some of the things that I later saw in these trailers after the movie when I went back and watched them. And I think that you will too. And I know that there's these studies saying that, oh, you know, people actually don't mind spoilers. They want to know what's happening in a movie. Sure, I guess. But for me, I think the impact of this film is really dulled if you know a lot more about it beyond the premise going in. The tension is really key to the film, and M. Night Shyamalan is able to sustain it throughout the entire runtime, largely because Knock at the Cabin comes in right around an hour 40 with credits, and when I was looking at M. Night Shyamalan's filmography, planning this review, I noticed that he's only ever made one movie that's over two hours. Glass, which was the culmination of his superhero trilogy, is two hours and seven minutes, I think. Every other movie that he's done has been between like 90 to 110 minutes. Good or bad, and you can certainly debate those points with just about every single one of his movies, you can't argue that he is a very economical filmmaker, and this is a very claustrophobic film in the sense that much of it takes place in this one cabin, really in one room in this cabin with a very small cast. If you you are not able to sustain that tension, then things could get very stale, very dry, and they don't. This movie actually flew along pretty quickly, and I think that M. Night Shyamalan doesn't get a whole lot of credit for still being able to sustain this tension. I think that he was sort of pigeonholed as the twist guy early in his career. He made some pretty bad movies, and to be honest, I didn't care at all for his last movie. I didn't like old at all. I thought it was a regression to some of his worst tendencies, but I'm also a defender of Glass, one of the few defenders of Glass. I've never really thought that he has lost his edge. This is M. Night Shyamalan working on a smaller stage, and I think that he works at this scale. But don't get me wrong, Knock at the Cabin is no masterpiece, and M. Night Shyamalan does still indulge in some of his most, um, I guess, weird tendencies. You can definitely tell that he took a pass at the script, especially in the first act, because you again have these characters that s speak like they're space aliens. I don't know why M. Night Shyamalan writes his characters this way. They talk in very short, declarative sentences that just sort of spell out facts about themselves, or it's just a complete non sequitur, although I do love there's a point where uh, Dave Bautista just uh, chimes in on what he thinks of a piece of children's programming that's on television. It comes from out of nowhere. It's so weird. I would love to pick M. Night Shyamalan's brain to understand why he writes his scripts this way because if his name wasn't attached to this movie, within 20 minutes, just based on the dialogue and the way that the actors were directed, I could tell you exactly who made this movie. Shyamalan also has a love for exposition via TV newscasts. This was used most effectively in Signs, one of the best moments in that film film, and then has never really been used as effectively since. However, he keeps going back to that. Part of it, I think, is because much of the film is set in a very remote location, so you have to find little portals into the outside world so people can check in and see what's going on. But it does feel a bit cheap exposition-wise, and a bit easy as far as how you're going to get the story across, and it's returned to a few times too many. But I think this is a pretty cool little one-room small cast drama that's centered around a central question. Would you make a very hard sacrifice if it benefited all mankind? Would you believe a group of strangers who told you that the fate of so many people in the world rested in your hands? It's the kind of question that's often reserved for science fiction, and this is being marketed as a horror film. I guess it is. There are definitely some horrific moments in the movie, but it's really more of a thriller suspense. If you're going for the jump a minute scares or even something in the vein of signs, that's not exactly what this movie is. It is a drama. It is tension. And that's really what Shyamalan does effectively here. The movie's anchored by Bautista's strong performance and two very compassionate co-lead turns by Ben Aldridge and Jonathan Groff. This isn't a sequel, as I mentioned, to The Happening, nor is it tied to it in any way, but I think that it very much is the movie that I think Shyamalan intended to make. He said, oh, it was supposed to be this B-horror thriller, whatever. I don't really think that that's true. I think what he was going for was something much more this tone, where you just have this overwhelming sense of dread and this information that's finding this group of characters from the outside world. It failed spectacularly in the happening. 
he succeeds here. And as I talked about before, while I have absolutely hated some of M. Night Shyamalan's previous movies, some of the worst movies I've ever seen, I do have a soft spot for him as a filmmaker. And maybe it's because I always see that ambition underneath even the worst of his movies or what seems like a genuine desire to entertain, even if those instincts are wildly misguided. I think that he is a very passionate filmmaker. I don't think he has a cynical bone in his body. And perhaps that's why I keep giving him chance after chance after chance and why I do look forward to a new M. Night Shyamalan film. Because as I said, they are provocative for good or for ill, but it is very nice to come out of an M. Night Shyamalan film talking and talking because I actually liked it. So that's a general recommendation for me on Knock at the Cabin. Not a spectacular work of cinema, but I think a pretty strong entry in M. Night Shyamalan's filmography. It is playing around the country right now. Are you going to check it out? Did you already check it out? Let me know what you thought of the movie down in the comments below. And before we go, I'm going to thank the sponsor of this video, Athletic Greens, the makers of AG1. You've been hearing about Athletic Greens on the show for quite a while now. I started taking it because I'm looking to support better gut health and overall better me. So what is AG1? Well, with one delicious scoop, you're absorbing 75 high-quality vitamins, minerals, whole food sourced superfoods, and more to help you start your day right. And it is super simple. I can either put a scoop right into a cup of water, or if I'm feeling adventurous, mix it into a shake for breakfast at home. Either way, it's a quick and tasty way for me to start the day off right and make sure that I'm supporting not only my gut health, but my immune system, my recovery, focus, and so much more. If you don't take a multivitamin or you've been trying to figure out which one to take, AG1 is a great choice because it's full of high quality ingredients that your body will actually absorb. So right now it's time to reclaim your health and arm your immune system with convenient daily nutrition. And to make it easy, Athletic Greens is going to give you a free one year supply of immune supporting vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. All you have to do is visit athleticgreens.com slash Dan. Again, that's athleticgreens.com slash Dan, D-A-N, to take ownership over your health and pick up the ultimate daily nutritional insurance. Thanks so much to AG1 for sponsoring this video, and thank you for watching. I'll be back very soon with more movie news, reviews, box office, award season coverage, and more. Until next time, stay safe, and I'll see you then. Bye.